All right, guys, so we'll have two days for the respiratory system. <clears throat> Again, a lot of this should kind of be a review based on what we did in the lab already. And by the end of the chapter, you guys should be able to describe the primary functions of the respiratory system, and you should be able to identify the organs that are in the respiratory system. Now, when we identify those organs, you guys should be able to split them up into the different like broad classes of respiratory system organs. We have an upper respiratory tract and a lower respiratory tract. Um, we also have a conducting portion and an actual respiratory portion. So you guys should be able to break those organs up. You should be able to explain how the respiratory exchange surfaces are protected. We'll see that the lungs are extremely delicate and we have multiple different things that we utilize to try and protect them from debris and pathogens that we might inhale. You should be able to talk a little bit about the larynx and the way that the larynx is utilized during normal breathing, as well as how it's utilized when we produce sound. Remember that the larynx is the voice box because that's where the production of your voice or sound comes from. So we'll look at how it is that we actually produce sound when we want to and when we just exhale when we, want to, when we don't want to produce sound. You guys should be able to talk a little bit about the alveoli and their functional anatomy or how their anatomy relates to their physiology. Um, you guys should be able, that's all like part one today, pretty much. Um, this all goes to part two. So define and compare the processes of external and internal respiration. We'll talk a lot about air movement and how it is that we move air in when we inhale and how we push air out when we exhale. So what muscles we use, what those muscles are doing, how we change volume, how we change pressure, all of that that's involved in, in bringing air in and out of our lungs. And then we'll talk about the actual gas diffusion that occurs. So the diffusion of oxygen into our blood and CO2 out of our blood. Okay, so some more kind of physics principles involved there. And then finally, we'll talk about how we control respiration. Okay, so the centers in the brain that we utilize to control respiratory rate, um, the rhythm of respirations, how deep we breathe, um, all of that we'll talk about at the very, very end. So the respiratory system includes the organs that we utilize to breathe. Right, to obtain oxygen from the air around us, and then to get rid of the waste product CO2 or carbon dioxide. The reason that we constantly need to be obtaining oxygen and getting rid of CO2 is because of ATP production. Right? ATP is the, the main cellular fuel or energy that we use in our cells um, to fuel growth maintenance, division, production of proteins, transport of ions, anything that requires fuel, we're probably gonna be using ATP to fuel it. And remember, we can make ATP a couple different ways, but what's the most productive way that we make ATP? Aerobically, right? It's called aerobic respiration. And what does aerobic mean? It's oxygen, right? It uses oxygen. So the most efficient way that we can make energy to use in our cells we have to put oxygen into it, so we need to keep giving ourselves oxygen, and then in that whole process, we produce carbon dioxide as a waste. And that carbon dioxide, we need to get out of our body somehow. So this is really the main <coughs> function of the respiratory system, to get the oxygen into our bodies and to push the CO2 out of our bodies. And the reason that we do that is for ATP production. Um, <clears throat> when we look at this, this kind of obtaining oxygen, getting rid of CO2, we see that the respiratory system and the cardiovascular system really work hand in hand. The respiratory system brings the air in and out, and it provides all of these uh, surfaces for diffusion to occur, right? For the oxygen to go from the air into the bloodstream, and for the CO2 to do the opposite, to go from the bloodstream into the air so that we can exhale it. Uh, so the respiratory system kind of gets the CO2 and gets rid of the oxygen, but then remember, we also do rely on the cardiovascular system to then deliver that, right? It's actually the blood and the heart and the vessels that will take the oxygen and bring it to the cells or to, or to take the CO2 from the cells and bring it back to the lungs. So we'll see that the two, the two systems do work hand in hand. Now the respiratory system, um, we just said really the main function has to do with getting oxygen and getting rid of CO2. But we do have a couple other functions that are kind of more minor functions, and we can break that respiration up into more specific definitions. So when we look at all of the functions of the respiratory system, we see that one, it provides all of the surface area necessary for gas exchange to occur. <clears throat> um, again, gas exchange is just the exchange of oxygen and CO2. So oxygen coming in, CO2 going out. 
that utilizes a lot of surface area. When we look at the lungs, um, deep down microscopically at the lungs, we'll see, remember, that the lungs are organized into all of these little chambers that we call what? Alveoli. Right, so the lungs are not like just perfectly smooth like that. That would not be very much surface area. We would never have enough gas exchange occurring. But microscopically, when we look at the lungs, we have all of these little chambers, right? All of these little grates or alveoli um, where gas exchange occurs. So that's really important that we have that huge surface area present so that the oxygen and CO2 can cross between the air and the bloodstream. <clears throat> um, the respiratory system also is conducting, right? It has this conducting portion, conducting as in like just moving things. It's responsible for actually moving air to the alveoli and then away from the alveoli, right? And that's just inhalation, so we inhale and exhalation when we exhale. That's also incredibly important, right? The exchange can't happen if we don't actually bring the air in and push the air out. And that is quite a process, um, as we'll see later. The respiratory system also has a lot of different components that protect the delicate alveoli. Okay, so the respiratory surfaces, the alveoli are like tissue paper. They're super thin, super delicate. So we really, really have to kind of baby them and protect them. So we'll see that a lot of our upper respiratory system, all of this stuff up here, really just exists to protect the alveoli. Okay, so the mucus, the cilia, um, the hair, all of that functions to help protect the alveoli. We also produce sound in the respiratory system. Um, remember that we have the larynx in the respiratory system. And what's the kind of common name for the larynx? The voice box, right? Because that's where this is coming from. That's where all the sound that we produce is originating, is down in that larynx or voice box. Um, the respiratory system also facilitates olfactory stimulation or smell. So we'll see that in the nasal cavity, um, in our nasal mucosa, we have olfactory receptors, right? Smell receptors. The receptors themselves are actually part of the nervous system, but the respiratory system is, is extremely important in actually allowing those receptors to come in contact with scent molecules. Um, first off, we have to inhale the air to begin with. That's a respiratory function. <clears throat> and then remember when we look at the nasal cavity, we said that the nasal cavity has these like twisting little turbinates right? The bones twist and curl the conchi so that the air gets bounced around through the nasal cavity. And as the air gets bounced around, all of the scent molecules are shoved into those olfactory receptors so that we can actually smell what it is that's in the air. Um, also, those conchi increase the surface area of the nasal cavity. The more surface area, the more receptors we can have. So the more different types of scent molecules we can distinguish between. Um, so we bring air in, we have gas exchange occur, we produce sound, we smell, we protect all of these delicate surfaces, and then finally the respiratory system is extremely important in maintaining the pH of our blood. And this seems kind of strange, right, how breathing actually affects pH of the blood, but it's extremely important. Um, our blood has a buffer system to try and keep the pH at about 7.35 to 7.45. And that buffer system, um, the, the reaction that we'll look at utilizes CO2. So we can alter our breathing to alter the amount of CO2 that we have to directly alter the pH of our bloodstream. Okay, so it's really, really important in maintaining um, the proper pH of the blood. We said that the respiratory system can be broken up into kind of two different sections or two different parts. When we break the respiratory system up or the respiratory tract up, we can break it up uh, anatomically, so just based on structures, or functionally, like based on what the structures are actually doing. So when we break it up anatomically, just based on structure, we divide it into the upper respiratory system, or you'll see upper respiratory tract, URT a lot, um, and the lower respiratory system or lower respiratory tract. The upper respiratory system is everything above the larynx. So not including the larynx, everything that is above the larynx. So that would be with the nasal cavity, the sinuses, and the pharynx or throat. That's all the upper respiratory system or upper respiratory tract. 
Um, and this area really just exists to prepare the air for the delicate surfaces of the lungs. Remember that the air, that once the air gets down to the lungs, we need it to be like just right. We need it to be humidified, so it can't be super dry. It should be pretty moist. The air should be warm. Um, the air should be free of things like dirt and dust. Hopefully it's free of pathogens. We've gotten all that yucky stuff out of it. Um, so we have nice, warm, humid, clean air for our alveoli. Um, we do a lot of that kind of conditioning of the air up in the upper respiratory system, right? We've got hair, we've got mucus, we've got this warm, moist epithelium. Um, so we, we trap and we humidify and we warm up that air so that we can then send it out. Um, we also have smell occurring, right, in the nose where our olfactory receptors are. So we do smell in the upper respiratory tract as well. The lower respiratory system then includes the larynx and below. So the larynx, the trachea, each of the different um, three types of bronchi, the bronchioles, and then the actual alveoli themselves being found in the lungs. We've got a couple main purposes when we look at the lower respiratory system. Um, one, sound production in the larynx, right? That's where our, our sound comes from as our voice box. And then we have the conduction of air and actual gas exchange. Again, the conduction of air is just like the movement of air. So we move air down the trachea, through the bronchi, through the bronchioles, and eventually to the alveoli. Um, and then the actual gas exchange is talking about when the oxygen goes into the bloodstream and when the CO2 leaves the bloodstream and crosses over into the air. Here you can see the division. Oh, sorry, we'll do the functional first. Then we'll see. So that was anatomically. Um, we can also break the respiratory system up based on its function. Okay, so we can say that there's a conducting portion and a respiratory portion. We said that conducting is literally just the movement of air. There's no gas exchange going on. Like the oxygen and CO2 aren't crossing anywhere. We're just taking the atmospheric air and bringing it into our bodies or pushing air out of our bodies. So the conducting portion is everything from the nasal cavity down to the terminal bronchioles. So that's, if you think about it, the nasal cavity, the pharynx, the larynx, the trachea, the bronchi, and then the initial bronchioles that we have. The respiratory portion includes the respiratory bronchioles, which remember are our smallest, last bronchioles with really thin walls. And then the alveoli themselves. In these areas, actual gas exchange can occur. So the walls of the respiratory bronchioles are thin enough for the gases to actually cross them. So we can exchange oxygen and CO2 across the walls of these respiratory bronchioles. So that's why we include them in the respiratory portion. They don't just conduct air, they do allow gas exchange to occur. Um, and again, remember from lab that the alveoli are the last little sacs, right? Like these little air-filled sacs, the last place that the air comes in and then we have gas exchange occur with oxygen flowing into the blood and CO2 going into the air, right? and then we exhale. So they're like the, the end of the line for the respiratory tract where most of our gas exchange is gonna take place. So typically, clinically speaking, we would break the respiratory system or respiratory tract up into the upper and lower respiratory tract. Um, and again, we would typically call this, like you would say URT for upper respiratory tract and LRT for lower respiratory tract. Um, infections, like when we talk about infections in doctor's offices or hospitals, we use these all the time. So if somebody has uh, you know, pharyngitis, if they've got an infection in the throat, they've got a URT, right? An upper respiratory tract infection. Um, if they have a lower respiratory tract infection, that would be something like bronchitis or pneumonia that's down lower in the system. Okay, so like sinusitis, pharyngitis would all be um, upper respiratory tract infections. The respiratory mucosa refers to the lining of the conducting portion of the respiratory tract or the respiratory system. So remember the conducting portion is almost everything, right? That goes all the way from like the nasal cavity 
through terminal bronchioles. Um, when we look at this respiratory mucosa that's, that's lining the respiratory tract all the way down to the alveoli, we'll, we'll see that in the alveoli it gets really different, structured very, very differently um, than the rest of the respiratory tract. Um, but when we look at this respiratory mucosa, we see that it has two major layers, an epithelial layer, and then underneath it has a supportive connective tissue layer. Epithelial layer, remember that epithelial tissue is a lining tissue, right? So it lines any open surfaces. Obviously the respiratory tract is like one big open surface, right? The nasal cavity, all the tubes that go down, they're open in the inside, they have the lumen. Um, so lining the surface of the entire respiratory tract is the epithelial layer. Um, again, you'll see that this epithelial layer changes drastically as we go from the nasal cavity. Um, the oropharynx is different than the trachea. Um, the bronchi are different from the bronchioles, which are very different from the alveoli. So that superficial layer changes a lot as the function of that, that part of the respiratory tract changes. Um, deep to that epithelial layer, again, we have a connective tissue layer that's really just supportive. Um, we call it an, it's areolar connective tissue. If you remember, areolar connective tissue is a loose connective tissue that we studied last, cha last chapter. Um, and we call it the lamina propria. In most of the respiratory tract, we see that the lamina propria contains mucus glands um, or mucus cells, and we'll see a lot of goblet cells present um, up near the epithelium as well. And those just secrete a nice, moist, sticky mucus under the surface of the respiratory tract. Um, again, we'll see this through most of the um, respiratory system, the trachea, the primary, secondary, and tertiary bronchi, but we'll see that the mucus glands will disappear as we get down into the really small bronchioles and the alveoli, because we don't wanna clog those really, really small tubes um, with that thick, sticky mucus. So we keep that in the more superior parts of the respiratory tract. Um, in some parts of the lower respiratory system, specifically in the bronchioles, we'll see that we have smooth muscle in that connective tissue layer or in the lamina propria. Okay? And that smooth muscle, again, just like we saw in blood vessels, the smooth muscle can contract and that causes the tube to constrict and it can dilate and that allows the tube, or it can relax and that allows the tube to dilate. And again, just like in blood vessels, the reason we make the bronchioles bigger and smaller is to control airflow, right? Just like we control blood flow. So we can direct air to certain parts of the lungs at certain times. So we said that the superficial epithelium, right? Or that epithelial layer that lines the open areas of the respiratory tract changes drastically as we go through the whole respiratory system. So in the beginning, in the nasal cavity and the very beginning of the pharynx, the nasopharynx, so right behind the nasal cavity before we get down below the, or behind the mouth, we see that we have pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelial cells. Okay, so pseudostratified, remember, means that it looks like it's stratified, it looks like there's multiple layers, but they're not. Right? Every cell is actually connected to the basement membrane. Ciliated, um, remember, just means that there are cilia present on the surface of the cells. And columnar is just showing you the shape of the cell. Okay, so you've got all of these kind of pseudostratified, ciliated columnar epithelial cells um, lining the nasal cavity all the way back to the nasopharynx. We do see that we have a bunch of goblet cells or mucus cells present to put that nice sticky mucus under the surface of the cells. Once we get to the bottom portions of the pharynx, so that would be the oropharynx and the laryngopharynx. The epithelium changes. So the type of cell that's lining the oropharynx and laryngopharynx is no longer the ciliated pseudostratified columnar. Now we have stratified squamous epithelial cells, just like we have lining the mouth, right? So why is that? Why do you think that the oropharynx and laryngopharynx would have stratified squamous cells instead of the 
Cedar Strike Heights and Lake Coloma. Mm -hmm. What is it? Scat. What's up? Because you need what? No, I don't. I just don't know. Because you need what? No, tell me. I don't. I just can't understand. Because you want to push food in one direction? Okay, I kind of give you in the right track by saying there's food. Okay, there are there's food in the oropharynx and laryngopharynx, right? And there's not food up in the nasal cavity, right? You don't want things to get stuck there. Okay. And think about the cells themselves. So what does stratified mean? Many layers, right? Where do we have stratified tissue where there's normally a lot of exposure, exposure right? Stress, like our skin, stratified. Think about it, like you said, in the oropharynx and laryngopharynx, what's going down there? Not just air, like the nasal cavity, right? What else do we have? Food, Food. water. So if I take a tortilla trip, chip or a big piece of you know, crunchy French bread, and I chew it and I swallow it, it's gonna scrape at the walls of my oropharynx and laryngopharynx. Mm -hmm. And when it scrapes, if I only have one cell and I damage the membrane, I'm screwed, <laughs> right? There's not another cell underneath. But if I have a stratified layer of cell after cell after cell after cell, I can scrape off the first few, no big deal. Doesn't matter whatsoever because there's <laughs> always a bunch more coming up behind it. So the fact that it's stratified with a lot of layers provides protection, um, which is important because food and water are passing through that area. Also, you guys you know, kept mentioning the fact that things are going down, we need things to go only in that one direction, we don't want things to get stuck. And all of that makes sense too. Um, if you think about the fact that cilia are there to push substances, right, in one direction, and in the throat or in the lower parts of the pharynx, we're pushing food and water down forcefully with muscles. So it doesn't make sense to have these cilia beating up towards the mouth like this and then use muscles to push stuff against them. We would just constantly be destroying the cilia and they're constantly wasting energy to beat in the wrong direction. So it's just counterintuitive. It doesn't make any sense to have cilia going and pushing food against them and tearing them apart and going in the opposite direction. So again, the main point here is because in the lower portions of the pharynx, food and water also pass. Right, it's not just air. So we need the stratified layers to provide protection. There's no point in having um, the cilia present. They, they're just not gonna beat against the food or the water that we're swallowing. Now, when we get back to the top of the lower respiratory system, so that would be in the larynx. Um, when we get to the larynx, then when we get to the bronchi, we see that we go right back to the pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. Okay, so again, we've got those stratified, um, pseudostratified columnar cells. We have the cilia present, which means we're going to have goblet cells that make what? Mucus. That make mucus. So you know that um, That make mucus. So we go back just like we saw in the nasal cavity and endopharynx because we don't have food and water passing through here. We just have air going back. We still want to trap bad stuff in the mucus. We still need the cilia to beat the mucus and move it up and away from the lungs. When we get to the small little tiny tubes at the end of the respiratory tract, which remember we said were called bronchioles, now we don't see this, the pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium anymore. Now we see a simple cuboidal epithelium. Now, this simple cuboidal epithelium will have some scattered cilia, especially um, in like the first bronchioles, but the cilia kind of disappear as we go deeper and deeper and deeper down. Notice that there are no <coughs> goblet cells. So we are not secreting mucus into these bronchioles. They are itty bitty tiny little tubes mucus would clog them up. Um, also, remember they have muscle, so they can constrict and dilate. You don't want to put mucus in it and then have it constrict, and it's squishing this mucus that's all like clogged up, and then the tubes just don't work anymore. So we don't produce mucus and actively put it into the bronchioles. Now, we do have some cilia kind of scattered randomly down there, again, in lessening and lessening and lessening amounts, because the thought is some mucus might drip down. 
right? We're making mucus up more superficially. If the cilia aren't keeping up, if we're making tons and tons and tons of mucus, the mucus might start to overwhelm the cilia and drip down into those bronchioles, in which case we do want to be able to say, no, you know, get back out of here, go back up. Um, so there are some cilia present. Finally, once we get all the way down to the end to the alveoli, we see that we have a simple squamous epithelium. So the alveoli themselves, um, what does simple mean? One layer. One layer and how are squamous shells shaped? Flat. 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 So the alveoli are lined with this one layer of flat cells. Okay, what that means overall is that we have a very, very thin um, membrane. And that's gonna be really important because remember this is where the gas exchange occurs. Right, we're gonna, we'll see in a little bit that we align it with blood vessels. And we have air and we have blood. And we need the oxygen and CO2 to be able to go back and forth across that membrane. If this was a really big, thick cuboidal, I'm mean, sorry, columnar cell, that's too far for diffusion to occur. That's not gonna happen quickly. Even if this was a cuboidal cell, that's still too far or if it was stratified, right? If we had layer after layer after layer, that would be really hard for diffusion to occur across all those layers of cells. So it's important that it's just simple squamous epithelium in the alveoli so that um, gas exchange can occur quickly.